This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for our 99th long table, uh, who is Dr. Sarah Bond, Associate Professor of History and Director of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Iowa. And while ancient coins may be objects of study in their own right, I also think it's critical that we think about numismatics in a broad sense and always consider the human component of ancient money and how people uh, in the ancient world interacted with coins and money. Her presentation today, which is entitled Dignity and Monetary Mint Workers in the Late Roman Empire, centers less on coins and more on the people who produce them. Professor Bond's research agenda focuses on late Roman history, epigraphy, law, topography, and the socio-legal experience of marginalized populations in the ancient world. Uh, she is author of the book, Trade and Taboo, Disreputable uh, Professionals, Professions in, in the Roman Mediterranean, which was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2016, uh, which contains a chapter on mint workers, by the way. Uh, and importantly, she does not just write scholarly books and articles, but engages with the broader public about her research as a regular contributor for Hyperlergic, uh, a columnist at the Los Angeles Review of Books, and section editor at Public Books. She has also written for the New York Times, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the Washington Post. And you can also follow her on Twitter at Sarah E. Bond. So with that, I'll... Uh, hand it over to you, Sarah. Well, thank you so much. And I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. It's been a few years. I think the last time I was there was to, to hang out with you guys in maybe 2018. Uh, but I did want to, to say that I am very appreciative uh, to Nathan and very glad that he is now with you guys at the ANS and that um, I have worked extensively with the ANS uh, being a Pleiades editor, which is Pleiades is a, a database of geographic locations from the ancient world, um, working hand in hand with the ANS's databases to geolocate a lot of the coinage that is in uh, many of the databases that, that the ANS funds. So I'm constantly very appreciative to Ethan Gruber and to Andrew Reinhardt as well um, at the ANS for making many of the coins that we're going to look at available. Um, and as, uh, as Nathan mentioned prior, this is based on a chapter from my 2016 book, but that is being revised uh, and added to to make more accessible for the public because I'm finishing a book on the history of labor unions from antiquity up until the fall of Constantinople in 1453. So we're looking at long term um, associations, which we would later call guilds in the ancient world. So getting you guys' feedback today as professional numismatists, um, I, as an expert in Roman law and epigraphy, um, am, am indebted to you guys as the actual coin experts, because I'm really more interested, as we're going to talk about today, in the artisans that are creating them rather than the final product themselves. But well, we're going to start off talking uh, a little bit about coinage and competition and how coinage policies actually express a lot of the anxieties, but also the competitive nature between different emperors. Um, following their meeting in Milan in 313, Constantine re remained in control of the Roman Empire in the West, while Licinius oversaw the East. Um, and although they were partners, there really was a rivalry between them um, over a number of spheres. And one of those spheres was certainly coinage reforms. Um, in his earlier struggle to be recognized as the Augustus in the West, Constantine advertised his legitimacy in part through coinage by establishing the solidus. And I stick here with the uh, dating of, of people like Linsky and many others that think that the solidus was introduced at about 309 um, CE. 
But in the East, we have Licinius rejecting Constantine Solidus and struggling to maintain the minting of the heavier aureus. Um, and this valorized Solidus emerged uh, as the standard within the empire. But as we will see, um, Constantine and Licinius both use coinage reforms as well as legislation about the mint workers who are called monetarii in order to advertise that their supply authority and legitimacy was secure. Um, and so while we oftentimes think of coinage reforms as a way of advertising imperial propaganda, as we've seen with books by people like Carlos Noreña, um, I would argue here uh, in, in my paper today that one of the big ways that legislation signals to us that there were ways to tell people about the anxieties and, and about the, the reasons that, that these emperors are, are trying to um, create and justify their legitimacy, one way that they can do that is also by modifying the status of the workers that contribute to things like the arms supply and the fabrici, that is to say the factories of the Roman Empire, as well as the status of the mint workers. Because to my mind, one major thing that this legislation is doing is saying that I'm in control of my artisans and I am in control um, of the actual supply of the coinage. And here is the actual law itself that I want to begin talking about today. And we think that it was probably, um, if issued in July 21st, uh, 317 to the Bithynians, was actually issued um, by Licinius rather than Constantine, even though the Theodosian Code later on, as it often does, attributes it to Constantine um, rather than to Licinius. But in this law of 317, um, he says it is necessary that the imperial mentors always endure their social rank. That is to say, um, they can never escape it throughout their li lifetime and that they cannot achieve the ranks of perfectissimatus or ducanarius or centenarius or egregiatus um, because they are not allowed to ascend essentially to the, to the ranks of the equestrian orders. Um, and this is uh, one means of trying to essentially create a status ceiling for certain mint workers um, that they cannot ascend into the upper orders and thus escape from their officium, that is to say their duty to the state to be mentors. Um, and this is just one of many pieces of legislation I want to talk about today that shows us that essentially within the later Roman Empire, um, there was a system which is called the corporati system, and one which A.H.M. Jones referred to as a caste system um, that created essentially rather immutable statuses for certain groups of artisans and specifically for mint workers that were making coinage in the late Roman Empire. But we really uh, also have to, to go back to the beginning and to the, the reasons for why a lot of these professionals were oftentimes seen as suspicious or looked on um, with uh, a rather suspicious eye by, by other magistrates and workers. Um, an ostensible reason for limiting the dignities available to menders was their tie um, to essential positions within the men. But an additional reason was also overseeing them carefully. Um, and Constantine uh, has a number of pronouncements specifically on something that was a big anxiety in late antiquity and also even earlier, and that is to say counterfeiting. Um, in 321, the emperor alleged that imperial mentors were engaged in clandestine minting of money, and he attempted to stop the practice through threats that were directed at the counterfeiters and by proffering incentives for those informers that came forward um, and told on those individuals who had 
oftentimes the allegation was at night been taking things from the imperial mint or getting slag or coin uh, pieces of coin shave um, and, and taking it and turning it into illegal uh, counterfeited money at night. Um, and these measures imply that some minters illegally benefited from their close proximity to the imperial stores of gold, silver, and bronze. And I want to say that even if many of the mint workers were not counterfeiting the coins, what this law was meant to do was to serve as a public strategy in order to restore consumer confidence in coinage that it was being overseen um, and that the, the mint, even though it did give a unique opportunity for theft and coin shaving and stealing of the official dies, was being closely uh, overseen by Constantine in particular. So we have law serving the purpose of creating what might be called a, a caste system for the creation of mint workers in the late Roman Empire, but also using this legislation as a rhetorical means of trying to bolster consumer confidence in the coinage that is being created by Constantine and by uh, many others. Uh, as I so often do, I'm going to say a lot of dates today, like I'm going to go back uh, to the much earlier period of the Republic in just a second. So I wanted to, to lay out a little bit of a, a timeline here, even though we will come back to Constantine and Licinius um, in, in the later period of the talk, that I'm going to talk a little bit, um, I have a, a typo here, dedication of the Temple of Juno Monita. Um, in Rome in the year 344 BCE. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the organization of the mint into workshops, which are called opikini, um, and it's where we get the word office um, even today in order to produce coinage. Uh, I will mention a very important law of Sulla's in 81 BCE called the Lex Cornelia de Falsis, which looks at um, two different treatments for those individuals um, who are found out to be creating counterfeit coins. Um, we have free men who are going to be allowed to, to be banished um, from the city, whereas enslaved persons who are caught counterfeiting coinage are put to death. We're going to talk about a big shift then in the status of mint workers in 45 BCE when Julius Caesar decides to take enslaved persons from his own familiae um, and to put them to work in the mint, setting a precedent for the use of enslaved workers um, up until uh, the later period of late antiquity. We'll talk about the moving of the mint over to the Kylian Hill um, over near the Flavian Amphitheater, as well as a number of uh, epigraphic pieces of evidence that show that mint workers dedicated to various gods and goddesses um, during the period of Trajan, for sure. Uh, we will talk about labor upheavals and the use of labor collegia, that is to say unions, in order to rebel um, against the changes by the Emperor Aurelian in 271, which is commonly called the Mint Workers' Rebellion within Rome as well as uh, the legislation we just discussed in 317 and in 321, as well as an increase in the use of legislation in order to limit the ability of mint workers to marry who they want um, and for their children to be prorogued as mentors into perpetuity. Um, the men serve as mint workers, the women and daughters oftentimes are married off to other mint workers in the period of the late Roman Empire. So that's just a very short rundown of the timeline, even though I'm going to try and keep it to the 45 minutes um, that we have allotted today. Now, I just want to um, also remind us that I'm specifically talking today about imperial coinage and about mint workers that are employed by 
the official state moneta, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other types of coinage that existed in the Roman world, even though we don't always know their usage and we don't always know how they were, uh, how they functioned. There have been a lot of theories behind, um, for instance, the, the tokens that we call spentriae, um, and you have a depiction of just one of them here to the left um, that is Tiberian in date. Um, and we also have a lot of examples of provincial coinage that are being minted at the same time as the uh, imperial coinage that is officially being created. So this is one of those so-called provincial coins from Abila that is depicting Lucius Verus. Um, so I don't want to say that there aren't other types of coinage that I could be talking about in other types of mint workers, but today I really want to focus in specifically on the monetarii that are attached to the imperial mints. Okay, um, in terms of Moneta um, and the actual goddess uh, herself, um, I, I just want to, to mention that we have mint workers as the key producers and also um, creating the most visual medium of imperial propaganda that um, has ever existed. And we have Juno Monita as the person that is seen as the patron deity um, over top of these monetarii, even though we have many dedications that we'll talk about later. Um, but she is seen as the personification of trust and legitimacy as connected to the imperial coinage. Um, this is a, a denarius of the Republican moneyer um, Carisius uh, from 46 BC here, BCE here, and you can see some of the tools of the trade of the monetary on the reverse of the coin because we have an anvil, tongs, and a hammer um, with a laurel wreath uh, that is, is going around it. Um, and that cap right there is specifically the cap of Vulcan that is associated um, with mint working, but also with the creation of anything made out of metal in general. Um, and here on, on the uh, right side, you can see an aureus of Septimius Severus that also has Monita holding up the scales and a cornucopia, which uh, indicates um, that you have a fecundity or, or kind of a overwhelming amount of, of um, of good things that are happening at that time, that there is the cornucopia is representative of things um, being in great abundance in general. Um, and these are all uh, put onto coinage as a way of, of trying to um, tie the coinage to an actual goddess, but also at the same time of trying to, again, increase the consumer confidence um, in the coinage itself. Um, but actually speaking about the temple of Juno Monita uh, herself, I think is very important because in the Republic, Rome's mint was located near the temple of uh, Juno Monita itself, which stood on the rocky uh, arcs of the Capitoline Hill itself. Um, the, the temple occupied a potent and symbolic space and looked out over top of the Roman Forum allowing for shoppers and merchants to gaze up from the forum and with a glance to be reminded of the institutional and divine protection over their coinage. Um, Livy notes that there was a dedication of the temple by Marcus Furius Camillus in 344 BCE, and it's possible that the association of the mint with the temple also extends back to that time. But we know that between 320 and 280 BCE, Rome began to produce more coinage, with minting becoming further regularized around 225 CE. Um, this was overseen specifically um, by administrators that were called triumviri monetales, and the mint workers were organized into an officina, that is to say a, a type of workshop of artisans that was very similar to what we call in Greek an ergasterion. Um, and that Livy references the officino monetai 
uh, in order to suggest that possibly these workshop organizations were in existence from very early on. Um, we don't know whether Livy's reference to these workshops was actually anachronism, um, but it does appear very much by the end of the second century BCE that there were organizing units um, called Afikini that would endure well into the period of late antiquity. Uh, now, I'm sorry for the bad resolution here. I could not find um, a better high resolution from this very um, wonderful um, relief that we have uh, that you can see um, in the Museum of Abruzzi uh, today. Um, but oversight of the mint from the Republic into the empire was a very important duty and one uh, that is underscored by Plutarch's remark that Sulla entrusted Lucullus to perform the duties of the highest significance, for instance, the management of the men. Um, in the Republic, you had minor magistrates called triumviri or tracevere monitales, as I mentioned before, uh, who oversaw the mint and saw it as part of their cursus honorum. That is to say, um, the offices that you hold as you go higher and higher um, into higher magistracies, hopefully culminating um, in the earliest year that you could hold um, the consulship. But later on, we find out that Inscriptions tell us that the workshop floor itself was actually supervised by people called Afincanatores, um, and they oversaw the Afikini. Um, a lot of people wonder, and certainly people like Michael Peachin have, have written about, um, how many workshops were actually in existence. And we think from about the beginning of 130 BCE, the early control marks that start appearing on coins that use Latin letters um, on the obverse and reverse of dies, they tell us that these dies were employed um, in the organization of the Republican mint itself. Um, and Michael Crawford has demonstrated that these dies are plotted out and can reasonably show us that only one workshop was likely um, being used, and they had multiple anv anvils within the Afikina, um, and that each die, um, uh, each die was being used, and then two Afikina um, are then set up, probably within the end of the second century BCE, and the Afikina would rotate um, kind of with worker time. So we think what happened was, you know, there's a worker shift for we don't know how many hours, perhaps eight to 10 hours for one Afikina um, to use the dies, and then they would switch um, over to uh, the second one. Um, eventually, these two workshops alternated in years um, rather than during the day uh, by the late second century BCE, and they shifted between preparing the issues and actually minting the coins. Uh, and later, these two workshops would work simultaneously at the same time. And so as we'll see with the multiple Afikini um, later during the period of Trajan, um, that we go from one to two switching off, and then there's such a high demand for coinage that they're working simultaneously um, in order to create them. Uh, now, do we have any images and understanding of the actual people that were working within these Afikini? Um, and we are going to see a lot of tools um, that, that are displayed that we are confident about, um, but we don't always know with 100% certainty, even though we know about the tools, whether the reliefs and epigraphic evidence that we have um, from the ancient world actually reflects the moneyers um, themselves. Um, so this is a very famous relief of two freedmen named Publius Licinius Philonicus and Publius Licinius Demetrius. Um, my colleague and wonderful friend Liv Yarrow um, does not think that these are mint workers. Um, I <laughs> tend to think that they are because you have the tools of what could also be a blacksmith up in the pediment um, at the top. Uh, this is um, 
a relief from uh, the early uh, Augustan period um, in all likelihood, three, 30 to 10 BCE, um, which many people think are uh, examples of mint workers, but which other people think uh, may just be examples of a blacksmith and a carpenter. But regardless, we do know um, that, that this is generally um, what, what these um, individuals are, are looking like. A lot like, as we'll talk about, blacksmiths and also jewelry makers who oftentimes would dip into being mint workers and then when not needed to dip out to it um, to do other types of jobs that were directly connected to the creation um, of money. But as I mentioned before, there is a huge change that happens um, in mint workers and in the Roman mint in general um, in the year 45 BCE. Um, what happens is that right after his victory at Munda, we have Julius Caesar installing his own enslaved persons as supervisors of the imperial mint, probably in order to provide him with more direct control um, over the coinage. Um, and he certainly wasn't the first person to recognize that using servile labor within the Afikina of the Monita was extremely, um, it, you're able to control the individuals to a much higher extreme. Um, and one that is also a, a very unfortunate extreme and reminder of the use of slavery in the ancient world, because um, within Athens, for instance, there was the use of public enslaved persons, that is to say, enslaved persons owned by the polis themselves that were called demosioi. Um, these are, in Latin, we call them servi publici, um, and they are enslaved persons within Athens who minted um, the coinage themselves. And oftentimes, this is important because um, within the Roman Empire, citizens were not uh, allowed to be corporally um, as vulnerable as slaves were. So if we go back to, to the, my mention of the legislation earlier um, of Sulla and his counterfeit coinage law, um, it indicates to us that counterfeiting coins after 81 BCE um, people are banished for it if they are in Genui, that is to say freeborn, but if they are slaves, they are killed outright. And the same goes for most of the laws we have within the Roman Empire, is that enslaved persons are very vulnerable to physical attack, um, to being hit, to being struck, and to being penalized in a way that Roman citizens um, are not in the same capacity. So I think that Julius Caesar choosing um, to have enslaved persons within his mint is very conscious so that he can exact full bodily um, and perhaps fatal control over those individuals when he is introducing um, his coinage. Now I wanna say just um, a little bit as well about other people that are working um, as officials within the Mint at this time. Um, for instance, we have Imperial cash tellers who are called dispensatories um, who pro provide us uh, a notable example that even though when they are of servile status, um, they could and did accrue vast wealth. Um, so, uh, one thing to keep in mind is certainly a lot of these enslaved workers within the Mint, uh, we tend to think those individuals who are enslaved are um, not wealthy and do not have any means, but we do have a, a lot of evidence epigraphically that even those enslaved workers that are connected to the Mint um, uh, in this period of the, the late Republic and the early empire um, still did accrue uh, a large amount of wealth um, and many of them were able to buy their freedom um, and to become themselves what we call liberty, that is to say freed persons. Now the position of dispensator was in such high demand that only one slave in the early empire is said to have paid, uh, that one slave in the early empire is said to have paid a million sesterces for the privilege. And this tells us that proximity to money and specifically to the imperial house was apparently worth the price um, even for uh, enslaved persons. 
Now, in the early empire, Rome's mint continued to be the main producer of imperial coinage. Um, between 70 CE and the early second century, the mint was relocated near to the Flavian Amphitheater on the Caelian Hill. Um, and it is in this context of the mint that we really have a number of inscriptions that date to the year 115 uh, CE that are found near to San Clemente that suggest a range of mint positions that I want to go through um, that are not just enslaved persons, that is to say Serbi, but also now tell us that a mix of freed person and end enslaved persons are working in this new context of the monita when it is moved over um, to the area of the Flavian Amphitheater. And I've tried to visualize as well as I can here um, what these inscriptions, which are CIL 6, 40, 42 to 44, um, what they actually tell us about the actual setup of the mint and the statuses of the people, as well as the names of the various officers that are working within each um, Afikina. So although the mint as a whole was overseen by an equestrian procurator monetai by this time, under the supervision of the emperor's a rationibus, um, we have the highest official listed on these dedicatory inscriptions as a freedman. Um, and this is the optio et exactor ori argenti et aris. Uh, and his name is Felix. So I have Felix up here right at the top um, uh, at the, in the area of the gold, who was assisted by another freedman, uh, optio, whose name was Albanus. Um, along with nine other servile assistants. Um, and we have uh, a number of those assistants that would have, have been around this area um, of the, the social status within the Mint. Below the Optio and the Trajanic inscriptions were 16 freedmen Afikinatores um, who oversee each of the Afikinae. 17 freedmen who served as signatories, um, 11 freedmen and slaves who functioned as SAPA stories, and we will go over some of these uh, actual offices in a second, that probably placed the flans on the anvils so that they could be struck, and then 38 intermixed enslaved and freedmen people called maliatories who served to hammer out the coins themselves. Um, other persons variously employed by mints were people called numelarii, who served as money changers. Um, in other words, they get the money into circulation um, within the city of Rome and elsewhere as well. Uh, and they probably also checked and bagged the coins um, along with afincadatores um, who oversaw them. It's also important to say that no collegium, no societas, no corpus, no group of people um, who formulated uh, their or own organization or had an organization foisted on them were without religion as part of that familia or, or collegium. And this goes for um, the organization of the mint workers within the monita during the early empire as well. Um, this is a, a good example of one of the dedications to, uh, to a deity that these voluntary associations um, and involuntary associations are dedicating to. Um, this is CIL 6239, and it is dedicated to the Guineas, uh, uh, to the Guineas of the Familia uh, Monitalis. So we also have dedications that were made to Fortuna Augusta, Apollo, Hercules, Victorious, uh, Victoria, as well as the Guineas, that is to say kind of the, the soul or je ne sais quoi of, of the, the actual familia itself as its patron deity. Um, we have a lot of ambiguities, uh, I know, about 
how the mint staff was actually organized in each of the mints and the number of workers within each Afikina. Um, but I will say that uh, a study of mint workers in the late Roman period within specifically the cities of Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch um, have told us that by about the early fourth century, we think about 200 workers per mint are actually working to create coinage. Um, so as we'll see, the number of mints are going to, to really proliferate um, into the period of late antiquity, but you just have to imagine kind of 200 artisans in all likelihood, give or take, uh, within each of these workshops. And we can see that um, these workers are visible within society and they are being acknowledged. Um, this is a late fourth to early fifth century um, medallion uh, that has Nero on the obverse, but on the reverse of it, we see, for instance, the actual visualization of the anvil and the tongs again, as well as a signator and workers, a maliator, a suppostor, um, as well as the overseer of the whole process, who's called the afficonator. Okay. Now that we've established um, a little bit about the mint workers and how the mint is actually set up, especially within the area of Rome, we also have to talk about the fact that um, there were upheavals and that the status of the mint workers um, does seem uh, to grow within the period um, of the, the later Roman Empire. Now, uh, during the period that we call the mid-century crisis or the crisis of the third century, there's a lot of um, literature and argument about whether we can even call it that. Um, there was the problem of debased coinage. Um, and one of the things that the Emperor Aurelian attempted to address when he came uh, to power was met with resistance, it seems. Um, as had been the case in the Republic and the early Principate, Emperors still heavily depended on the mint in Rome for coinage during the period, um, and specifically on the city's monita, um, which had a number of mint workers who were being overseen by somebody called a rationalis. Um, and at this time, the rationalis, this high-ranking official within the city of Rome, was named Philicissimus. Um, and essentially what Aurelian does is when he's looking at trying to reform the coinage and to figure out why it's been so debased, um, he decides uh, that he is going to remove Philicissimus from office. Um, and when this actually happens, um, we see that the mint workers rebel against this decision um, within the city of Rome. Um, and many of the senators within Rome as well actually give support to these mint workers um, because they do not like the uh, set, uh, accession of um, Aurelian to power in the year 270. Um, if we can believe the Historia Augusta, which, you know, that's a question in and of itself, um, we are told that 7,000 people died as a result of this insurrection um, of mint workers. Um, but I really think that, that this human toll can tell us a lot about the changes that Aurelian made both to the minting process um, and also to the status of the mint workers following the mint worker rebellion. Um, to my mind, Aurelian figures out that really these mint workers um, have been given a higher and higher amount of power and status within the city. And so he disbands the mint at Rome, even though it will be put back together along with the mint at Milan um, in the year 273. He executes almost all of the mint workers within the Rome mint who had um, actually revolted, but he takes a few of those mint workers and creates a traveling mint that goes along and follows the emperor as he actually um, travels through the provinces. So we know that he sets up a, a number of mints at his new capital, for instance, at Sertica um, and uh, also at Cologne, but he is also taking 
traveling mint workers with him, which will serve as a model for later emperors like Diocletian and for Constantine um, to set up new models for minting and for coinage reforms, which specifically focus on the diffusion of mints, but also um, having mint workers directly following the emperor as he travels around into the provinces. Okay. Um, one thing to, to really bring up here as we're starting to see more and more mentors being used, but not as frequently um, uh, necessarily, they're not making uh, coins perhaps every single day, uh, not all of the mints are being used at one time, um, is that when you have usurpers within the late Roman Empire and when you have um, legitimate emperors as well, that they're oftentimes drawing on artisans as they're setting up more and more mints, and we'll look at a map of these mints um, in, in just a few, that we have static monetai publicae that are being set up and overseen by an equestrian procurator monetai, but that we also have the monetica comitatensis, who begins to follow around the tetrarchs during the period of the tetrarchy and then into the period um, of Constantine. And that many of these mint workers we think um, are not enslaved, um, that they are oftentimes freed persons or people who are freeborn, who are serving as jewelers, um, who are serving as blacksmiths, um, who have uh, a knowledge of other handicrafts connected to metallurgy um, who serve as mint workers part-time when they are needed, either when the mint is actually functioning um, or if they, uh, or if they um, are needed by a usurper, for instance, um, in order to create them. We know, um, for instance, that there was a usurper named Carousius. Uh, who tells us that um, in the year 286, he establishes five mints um, and that he pulls from local artisans and seal stone cutters, as well as intaglio specialists. Um, when he sets up his mints, he attracts artisans from local towns in order to produce the dyes that he uses um, within his mint. So because many of these mints are laying dormant for periods of time, um, I really want to, to suggest to you that being a mint worker um, oftentimes was not necessarily a 100% full-time job and that side hustles uh, that you could be both a blacksmith or a metallurgist and a monetarius um, in certain mints in certain areas. Doesn't seem to want to change. Ah, oh, there we go. So disbanding the mints altogether was perhaps one way uh, to control uh, the mentors, but another method was simply to revoke, I think, yes, yeah, was to revoke elite privileges as well. Um, so into the course of uh, the, the period of the, the fourth century, oh, I've gone too far yet again, sorry. Um, into the course of uh, the fourth century, um, we see that, that there is actually um, mentors that are working in the city of Sisychus uh, who demonstrate to us um, that they are, are being um, supported and giving special dispensations. We know that um, there is a precious metal shift within the mint um, at Sisychus. Uh, we know a lot about the mint workers that, that are working there and are given special allowances that they um, have a cottage system of production that means that they were making clothing for soldiers and coinage at home and then depositing in it and bringing it um, to centralized organizations later. So mint workers don't necessarily um, have to work specifically within the monetai itself, that there were special dispensations sometimes given to these um, independent contractors, let's say, uh, that are working within um, specific mints in order to supply the imperial coinage. Now, 
We do know a lot about the traveling uh, coma detentionment that I have mentioned before, and we don't need to go through each of them, um, but we do know from legislation that came out um, in the Theodosian Code um, and a law specifically of 384 that outlines the fact that the coma detentionment that follows the embers around uh, became much more concerned with coinage um, um, and with organization. So we have, uh, for instance, department, two departments that deal with gold um, overseen by a primacarius and a secondarius with two ducanarii, four centenarii, and four messengers as well. Um, and we also have uh, the overseen of bullion as well as the secondary coins and gold that are exchanged through the mints in each of the dioceses. Um, they employed a staff of what we call um, orifice specierum. These are goldsmiths um, along with mentors of gold coins and great engravers and other types um, of craftsmen. Uh, the law of 384 really just allows us to see the very fine grain organization and oversight um, of the Comitatensian uh, mints in general. And we can also, from a lot of this legislation, be able to begin to rebuild um, the actual coinage flow that is happening once the mint workers actually make their coins. So once the coinage is actually being minted, going directly to a department called the Come Sacrarum Largationum, um, before uh, it is being dispensed to things like um, the coma detention mint um, uh, from the arms and armors and the mines, we're having these minted coins then going specifically to being paid out um, as the uh, as the salary, as the as the actual payment to people in the army, in the civil servant, uh, in the civil service, as well as barbarian payments that are being given out. These are actually how the coins are getting into circula circulation um, is by then uh, being spent by the army, um, being used um, in order to pay for things like public works. Um, so all of these individuals are working together um, with not only the coma detention mint, but also the static uh, meant within the diocese um, in order to get all of this coinage, both traveling mentors and static mentors to get this coinage into circulation. But because uh, these mentors were seen as so important to the security and to the trust uh, in the economy of the fourth and then the fifth century, we see an increasing number of laws that are limiting mint workers from choosing other occupations, from ascending into the upper ranks of, say, the equestrians or even the, the senatorial orders, um, and also uh, a lot of limits that are being put even on the people that they can marry. Um, and so we have two laws specifically from 365 and 380 that tell us that freeborn women uh, who marry weavers and they uh, after are solemnly warned uh, do not prefer the splendor of their birth or the low condition of their contubernii, they shall be bound uh, by their condition of their husband. So we know that weavers then are, are kept from being able to marry other people, but then mint workers are not allowed um, to, to marry whomever they want as well. And women who chose to marry a mint worker would lose their status altogether um, and become the status of the mint worker. And so um, even though a lot of people at this time appear to be competing to work in mints, once you actually become a monetarius, oftentimes it becomes a very family business where sons begin to become mentors and the wives um, and even daughters oftentimes will marry uh, male mint workers themselves. All of this can tell us is that Law can indicate to us that there was a degraded status, but that does not necessarily mean that these individuals who by this time were a mix of freeborn people and also um, uh, liberty, 
that they are not still held in civic esteem. It seems as though people are still paying top do dollar to become monetary, -E, but that they are being kept in a social caste system, um, which is per perpetuated so that there is uh, no anxiety about who exactly will be minting the coinage and whether or not it is going to, to be secure. So both the marriage restrictions um, and also the increasing use of the corporati system um, were very important because mint workers also were exempted from military service. They were exempted from a number of civic munera, that is to say um, compulsory labor and also um, financial uh, taxes that they have to pay as part of their, their yearly munera. Um, and being a part of this corporati system, while it was very restrictive in the types of jobs that you could do, was oftentimes sought out because it exempted you from a lot of other more onerous things, such as military service or serving as um, a local town councilor that you might not actually um, want to take on. Now, just Finishing up here in my last uh, minute or so, I want to say that um, even though I don't talk extensively in the chapter about it, um, the status of mint workers um, who in the Western area uh, of Europe during the Middle Ages are oftentimes referred to as moneyers actually ascends very high in status, um, even higher than it had been in the late Roman Empire. Um, into to the period um, of especially the 15th and 16th century, when they're really seen as being the right hand of the king or the, the local potentate. So this is a woodcut illustration of a later medieval minting scene under the Emperor Maximilian I, but moneyers um, and control of moneyers in terms of their status, but also control uh, in terms of the quality of the coinage that they're actually making uh, were very important well into the period of the Middle Ages. And so I, I think looking at not only the actual product and the coinage that is being made, but also the status of the artisans themselves can tell us uh, a lot about the attitudes, the anxieties, and also the attempts at legitimacy that are being uh, created and, and striven for by by the emperors themselves. So I look forward to, to talking to you uh, a little bit more. Um, about these mint workers if you have any questions. And uh, like I said, all of the specifics and all of the actual detail is certainly um, in my, my chapter in my book, uh, which I've passed along as a PDF to um, both Emma and, and to Nathan. And I'm also happy to, to answer any questions now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was uh, that was gr excellent. Great. Thank Sorry, you. that's like a very sweeping, huge overview of of about eight hundred years. Um, as yeah. is my, <laughs> as is my, um, you know, uh, normal mo. But I'm happy to to talk more specifically about actual details that I kind of flew through there in our in our forty five minutes. <laughs> so we'll open it up for questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Sarah? Perfectly convincing. I should say that that they're uh, they're amazing people that help me uh, with this chapter over time because I am not a numismatist. So I mentioned Michael Peachin before, but Michael Peachin uh, went through this chapter meticulously uh, to help me with it, as well as Kun Verboven, um, who is a wonderful, um, wonderful expert in voluntary associations and Richard Talbert um, as well. So I'm, I'm thankful to many people who helped uh, with this reconstruction of the men. Yeah. Jill? You're muted, Jill. Oh. Sorry. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. And I, I, I have a, qu a question about the Republican period. So we, we're seeing that from Julius Caesar, the mean workers belong to the, uh, well, to Caesar's household, and it 
mutates into a form of bureaucracy as you know as we all know the uh, uh, the the imperial domus becomes like the nucleus for uh, what we call now uh, public service. But for the Republican period, where there was no, there was no, not much in terms of civil service, and most of the public functions were farmed out uh, to societates publicanorum and, and, and so on, do we have a sense of um, is a mint a kind of um, profit center run by some societates um, under contract with Republic? I mean, do we know this type of obligation or relationship between the Republic and the mint itself? We don't know a lot about the workers until we actually get to Julius Caesar because there's an explicit mention, and I think I have it down here, but it's in Plutarch as well as in Suetonius about exactly what you said, the Familia Caesaris essentially becomes an extension of Julius Caesar and of the later emperors within the mint and on the mint floor. Um, and within the Republic, we just don't know very well about the people that are being overseen by the Tres Viri Manitales. So every year, are the Tres Viri Manitales bringing in new workers? That doesn't seem like, like something that would actually happen. You want trained artisans in there that are there year after year, even if the overseers are being interchanged during the Republic. So, I mean, we know the status only really from about Julius Caesar forward, even though we know that mint workers are mentioned, we just aren't told what their status is, and we aren't told um, where they're coming from, and we aren't told that it's a public service at all. It does not seem that they're Servi Publici. This is something that I've talked with. Probably the world's expert on Servi Publici are, is, is Nolinsky, who has a wonderful article on them, um, if you ever want to, to read it. Um, and I've written on Servi Publici as well in towns like Philippi. Um, and it does not seem, because it hasn't been, I mean, we can't argue this just from absence, but they aren't mentioned as being mint workers. Like, Servi Publici aren't mentioned as, as people that are being served, uh, that are actually serving within the mint. So it does seem that perhaps these are just um, artisans that, that may be a mix of different statuses. And then for sure, in 45, Julius Caesar steps in and is like, look, we're putting my enslaved persons in the mint to create an assurity and control over the bodies of the mint workers as well. So I wish I could tell you more about the Republic, but Livy really doesn't offer much of anything about the actual mint workers themselves. Yeah. Did they have mint guards? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading a few of them here. Um, did they have mint guards? Yes. Um, the Afinca Notores, uh, they have the power of corporal punishment from 45 forward for enslaved persons. And so um, they can be beaten, they can be killed um, if they're slaves. Uh, and so um, mint workers who are found to be counterfeiting um, are prosecuted under Sulla's law. Um, but there are a number of other laws um, and also just the powers of the Afika Notorious that allow them to beat uh, or maim or kill mint workers if they're seen to be, if they're coin shaving, for instance, and you see them like taking a little bit of the, the metal um, or sneaking out. Um, I always tell people that the control over people's bodies is not just an ancient thing. If we think about diamond workers, if we think about diamond workers that are working in mines um, even today, they're corporally searched, even their body cavities, like their mouth and everywhere else, those diamond workers are searched fully before they leave the mine. So we have to kind of think that using enslaved persons is also a way of fully controlling a human body. So, um, yeah, Susan. Yes, um, I was thinking about how many workers would this be? And then what was the population of Rome during that time? 
That's a great question. And so I'm going to default to the Walter Scheidel number ish of the high empire. Um, you know, Walter Scheidel, TM, uh, all of these numbers. But I mean, uh, about a million people, or if we're talking about 115 in the dedications, um, we think, I would guess um, somewhere between in the I would guess um, in, in Rome in 115 that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100 to 150 mint workers. And we know that in late antiquity, it's probably about 200 for a million people within the city of Rome, but they're supplying coinage well beyond just the city of Rome. So it's not just serving the population of a million people in 115 under Trajan. It's serving a lot of, a lot of other people um, within within the empire. And I'm trying to think, everybody will correct me, I'm sure, the total estimate at that time, I want, uh, everybody can correct me, I think it's somewhere around like 6.5 to 7 million um, in the Roman Empire at that time. But again, if my numbers and demographics are off, uh, then then I am I will have to, to get back on that. But I feel like it's around 6.5 to 7 million estimate at that time for the whole empire. And do you do you have any estimate on how many coins per day they would make? Ooh, that is a tough one. I do not know. I I mean, I'm I'm welcome to to give uh, input from other people, but I have not seen an estimate um, of of how many are coming out of the Rome Mint per day. I haven't seen a per diem okay. that way. Oh, 50 to oh, 70 million. Oh, then I'm way off. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, ha I will have to go back and, and read up uh, my demographics. Um, that, that's a very good point, 50 to 70 million. But yeah, 1 million within the city of Rome. Um, but I have never seen an estimate exactly of how many coins per day coming out of the, the Rome men. We had a question in the chat about um, what the color coding on the map uh, referred to. Oh, that's that's just the the four different compartments within the tetrarchy. So we okay. have two Augusti, two Caesars. So I just separated it color, 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 color for Augustus, Caesar, Augustus, Caesar. Um, so it. for the four different um, districts, essentially the dioceses that are that are being um, overseen. Um, so yeah, the the color for the the map needs to be redone with a proper um, ancient world mapping center uh, map on the background. Right now I had it um, previously before we got them up and running again on uh, on an old Google map, but I, I need to transfer them, them over to a new map tile. But yeah, they're just based on um, late fourth, early fifth century uh, areas for each Augustus and Caesar, which are four total. Great, thank you. There's another question in the chat that just popped up um, asking about bibliography on sociological aspects uh, discussed in this presentation. I suppose, first of all, we would send them to your book and the chapter in your book, right? I, uh, that's the first link yeah. in the chat. Uh, maybe you'd have something else you'd recommend. Well, I mean, I think that that I have all of them very much listed uh, in in all of them in in the um, it's it's all an amalgam. There's no like independent study just of like one book that's on mentors. So I have aggregate in the notes for the pages. You know, I have the notes section that has basically the extensive bibliography for all of them, but there's no standalone book that's just on the lives of, of mint workers. But as I mentioned before, um, Michael Peachin probably has um, one of the, the best articles. Um, there's a very good chapter um, in David Vagie's uh, Coinage and History of the Roman Empire, um, as well as mentions about the the use of Servi Publici under Constantine that Nolinsky has in the Cambridge Companion to Constantine, as well as uh, parts about the introduction of the Solidus, for instance, as well. Um, and also Christopher Kelly has a wonderful book called Ruling the Later Roman Empire. And all of those comitatensian offices that I went through and tried to visualize for you guys, Chris Kelly, um, brilliantly puts together the bureaucracy and organization of the late Roman Empire in a way that 
I think no one else has has done um, in English. So if you're very interested in bureaucracy in the late Roman Empire, of which the Comitatensian Mint is a part of, um, I, I would say also Chris Kelly's book on bureaucracy is, is very good. But yeah, all, all of the the actual um, the actual uh, citations are are in the book for you guys to to go through. And like I said, it came out in 2016, so I'm happy to send along um, the bibliography. But I'm also currently in the process of updating it for the current book as well. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.